I'd like to thank everybody for coming along here and trying not to fall asleep when we're talking, which is uh, always a bonus. And, uh, and listening in, hopefully um, enjoying part of the weekend. And certainly, enjoy, I know you've been enjoying the food, so that's been a great thing. And that you've picked up some of our own enthusiasm for the Appalachian Trail, because you know you can't do this unless you really, really love the idea of doing a, an adventure for a long period of time. So uh, it's, it's a commitment to not only do the hike, but it's a commitment to come here and drive hundreds of miles in, in many cases, and we appreciate you doing that. The idea for this little wrap up now is um, we've got a few things that we haven't covered, um, one of which is giving back to the trail. And I know that Pony and Jester were quite interested in talking about some of that. So let's start with that first off. Okay. Um, I'm just going to give you a little bit of background, kind of my story um, as far as giving back. When I um, was hiking and pursuing my dream of completing the Appalachian Trail, I knew of the concept of giving back and, you know, always thanked every trail maintainer I ever saw, every trail angel. And uh, for my 40th birthday, a group of friends of mine actually got together and got me a lifetime membership to the um, Appalachian Trail Conservancy. And I just thought that was just the most incredible thing. And it wasn't until really 2020 um, during COVID that uh, I was drawn to really pursue and start giving back. And that just so happened for me to be on uh, the Mountains of Sea Trail and not so necessarily monetarily, we can all do that as well, but giving of your talents and your time to a trail in a brown path, or it could be your local park. It could be whatever you're called to do, but I do hope that each and every one of you, as you travel and pursue your dreams of completing the Appalachian Trail, I have gotten so much more fulfillment in actually giving back. And I didn't really understand that until I started doing that. So that's just my little spiel on that. And um, I, I don't think I'll ever stop giving back because it's given me so much. And I know, Clay, you wanted to talk. Yeah, um, <clears throat> I like what you're saying, Jester, just about the many different ways there are to give back. So just to very quickly point out, while you are on trail, there's endless opportunities to give back. That literally could be stooping down and throwing that branch off the, the, the tread that you see. It could be, um, as I literally did, uh, trying to manage the poop pile in the privy with a stick. You know, just anything that you want to do. Anything. <laughs> Sweeping out a shelter, I did that a bunch of times. So I just took all these little opportunities. Nobody even necessarily knows about them. And then obviously I've seen some of you um, helping around the hostels. I always volunteer, not looking for work per se, but just to say, hey, you know, as long as I feel up to it, which is almost always to say, you may have noticed I don't sit still that well. And I, so I go to the hostel owner and say, if you got anything for me to do, I'll do it. Give me the worst job. So you can get back in that way. I took the opportunity uh, in 20, the two years after uh, I finished the AT to volunteer for the ATC's Conorock Trail Crew. Conorock is one of five regional trail crews that they maintain. It's the oldest and most famous, but there's one for Mid-Atlantic and New England. And so wherever you are, you can get on an ATC trail crew. The ATC crews, their intention is to go in and handle, the maintaining club sometimes will balk at this, but what we handle are these bigger projects that require literally moving 600 pound rocks or building French drains or rerouting through a boulder field, you know, all these things where it's a little more technical and it requires some coordination. They put their, they have a roster of projects that need to be done. They go out and examine them and then it gets on the schedule five years in advance of when it actually gets done. So these are really, really important things that get done. It's fun. Uh, so far you don't have to pay which is pretty neat. Like Colorado Trail runs crews and you pay a, a modest fee to be able to go out. It's a lot like a through hike. You're living in the woods with a group of people you've never met uh, and you are working on something very hard every day and pulling in the same direction that camaraderie develops. You can go out for one week, two weeks, whatever. And like I say, I've done Conorock for a total of four weeks. 
I loved it. The experience is personally rewarding and then you are just giving back to the trail. But what I tell people is not everybody lives near enough to the AT to be able to do that. Not everybody lives near enough to any trail to do that. So just as Jester said, you've got parks in whatever town you live in, you've got open space, you've got a trail. Um, I always say just even one day a year because when you get out here and if you're fortunate, you run into a trail crew, you run into people doing this stuff. And, and if you wind up working on these crews, the work that's required to keep this thing going, if we just stopped maintaining, the local, the local clubs are responsible for cutting the weeds and you know cutting down fallen trees over the winter and stuff. If we stopped doing that for two or three seasons, it just would really be impassable. So it's worth doing. Um, I decided to volunteer when I was going down those steps after um, Greylock down to that Highway 9 in Vermont giant stone steps and I realized man it was pouring rain I'm like if these steps weren't here this would be really dangerous and hard and I thought my gosh somebody had to move these huge boulders and the next year I was moving a 600 pound rock in a nylon net with eight people I think of us you know it's you know one two three lift and you bump it over two inches so it's very rewarding give back any way you can while on trail uh, Eagle Eye was talking about picking up micro trash. Totally great thing to do. I pick up pieces of trash. There was a woman who hiked in my year called Gaia the Womble. She picked up real trash and she ended up picking up 350 pounds of trash on her whole hike. So many ways to give back. And I think, I don't know if this word resonates and I don't mean it literally, but it's sort of a spiritual thing. I just think it's so important to be like, making an effort the people who have given to you you're just going to get back and we're paying it forward so i must say i, I this this was going to be their section and but i'd like to say um because somebody said wrote wrote this to me the other day that i've given back to the trail by doing a podcast and I, I can't didn't even think about it totally. but i know a couple of you are here because you heard heard about this weekend and you've heard about all my guests stories and and every every guest has that story that will resonate with somebody and you might think oh, i remember that person i didn't think i could do the trail because of this but that person i said on the mighty blue show they did it for this reason and you and i, I get letters emails rather nobody gets letters anymore mm -hmm. i get emails literally two three a day about how my a particular guest has inspired them to consider hiking the trail. So I feel that's my part of giving back because the thought of me lifting a 600 pound rock does just uh, would not sit well with me at all. So well done for you, but uh, appreciate that. And people, you can give monetarily. Yep, oh, that's important too. Yeah. So that's given back, really, unless you feel, um, actually he's given back because he's got more people in the hammocks than anybody I know. <laughs> well, I mean, not just that, I was just sitting here, you know, especially listening to Clay and everything. And I mean, I look at the, the trails, whether it's the AT or any, you know, my local trails and all that, since I love the outdoors as much as I do, that's like my home. And so, you know, whenever I go out, whether I'm hiking, you know, the Florida trail, you know, certain areas or whatever, um, I normally try and pick up, you know, trash and all that stuff to, to help, you know, clean my, clean my living room or whatever, you know? And, uh, I mean, that's, that's why I did what I did, you know, whenever it came to max, you know, max patch, you know, drove all the way up from Florida because I mean that whenever, whenever I saw that, that was like heartbreaking. Yeah. And Don't so, yeah. yeah, exactly. And, that, and that's exactly how I felt, you know. Yeah, once you if you go out and specifically go clean up trash with people, you will begin to see more trash than you ever wanted to see, even in your own neighborhood and just around you. And it's like, wow, um, it, it's fulfilling to actually clean up and pick up trash and things like that. So, yeah. So that's giving back. Um, one of the things I've got here written here is um, dispelling AT myths. And once again, I, I, there aren't many that I, I, I can dispel, but I'll probably think of a few as we go along. But once again, Pony and Jester have come up with some myths to dispel. <laughs> talk about the Virginia, no, actually, let me talk, take one of yours. Yeah. The Virginia Blues. 
people talk about the Virginia Blues, and, and it, some, I've heard the reason being because it's a boring state. It's a quarter of the entire trail. My personal feeling, the Virginia Blues are because you're in the state for so darn long. You know, you go through Georgia relatively quickly, 80 odd miles, you know, a week or so, you're through Georgia. Then you've got North Carolina, you're in and out of Tennessee, and you pass through across eventually into just short of Damascus, you get into Virginia. And then you keep going, and you keep going, and you keep going. And about three months later, it feels like you, you get out of Virginia. I, I think that's part of what the Virginia Blues is from my perspective. I personally found Virginia to be a beautiful state. Ridge walking is a tremendous thing to do. And being up there, and you've got some great views up there, and the balds of, south, of, of southern, uh, the southern Appalachians are there. So if you, feel, if you feel you're having a bad day, don't put it down to the Virginia Blues. I suspect it's because you've been there for so darn long. Was that how you thought of the Virginia Blues or not? I loved, I loved Virginia, but I also didn't... I, I think that that is how a lot of people feel um, because of how long you are in there. But I kind of, I, I didn't focus on how long I was in Virginia at all because I kind of broke my hike up, you know, into to weeks or whatever instead of by sure, states. Sure, sure. And you, you were the one who mentioned it in the first place, Virginia Blues. Yeah, um, I never got the Virginia Blues because, you know, as a section hiker, I never completed the 500 miles in, in one stretch. But I put that on there because you hear that so much, but Virginia, to me, is one of the most beautiful, underestimated states on the Appalachian Trail that you could walk through. And if you're blue in Virginia, that might be one of those times you need to uh, treat yourself to a hotel room or a nice, wonderful hostel stay at the Woods Hole Hostel. Which is in Virginia. Though. Which is in Virginia. <laughs> this might be a mindset issue because there's no line. There's nothing distinguishing this state from any other. The trail just keeps going. So those borders are artificial, but they are also important. I know, Steve, somebody years ago, you had a great expression for it. I can't remember what it was, but I'll call them micro horizons. Here's what I'll say generally. Forget, I don't understand the Virginia Blues either because it's my third favorite state. It's got everything you could want. But what I do think happens is th this is monotonous sometimes, right? Current hikers, it's a little monotonous at times. And you're just walking and you know this and that. You don't even have to be hurting. So often for me and many people, little what i would just call micro horizons come up and and the, you do get excited it's the next shelter it's the next um state line that's a big one it can be anything it can be uh there's a road coming in there might be trail magic it can be absolutely anything that you are simp that's helping to just keep you moving forward during those times when unless you're extraordinary you will probably find it a little monotonous at times so I think that's a good game that I play with myself. Um, and other mental games, like people talk about doing 10 by 10, doing 10 miles by 10 a.m. To get that in your back pocket, and then you can sort of cruise the rest of the day, depending on how many miles you're gonna do. Just different tricks like that. Little things like, I didn't do this, but people like to do the four state challenge. There is a way that you can start in West Virginia, go through West Virginia, blah, 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 all the way to Pennsylvania, and it's 42 miles, and you go straight through, blah, blah, blah. Maybe you don't want to do that, but people create those things because it's a long haul, and it can be monotonous, so you're creating a little interest for yourself. That's the way I see it. Mm -hmm. I used to think that, uh, not, and it wasn't to leave boredom. I don't believe I ever got bored on trail, ever once. But I think it was... And the, my, my reason was partially fear, I guess, but what's around the next corner? Because there are always corners. You, you're, you're going down, you can see it turning, and once I, I went around a corner and there was a bear right in the path, right in front of me. A ways away, but right in front of me. And that's kind of exciting. And, it perks you up. Uh, yeah, it perks you up. And also, it was going nowhere. It was quite relaxed where it was. It didn't, didn't want to move at all. So we just had to step back a bit and just watch this bear and eventually it took about 20 minutes of us calling it for it to go it just ambled off in the woods looked at us contemptuously as it should do and uh, ambled off in the woods and, and we went through but obviously then you then go around the next call and you think oh what's around there 
and you might see a snake or you might see nothing for another hundred miles but there's always a corner and you're always turning it at some stage so I would look at it that way enjoy it and see always be looking for what's around the next corner because sometimes it will delight you sometimes it will frighten you and sometimes it will be just another corner to, to look at for the next time. There's a puzzling associated Virginia myth that Virginia is quote unquote flat. Um, I think that's just hopeful people, for, hopeful nobos having had their butts kicked coming through uh, the first three states. The truth is I did the numbers because I did a story about nine myths of the AT and how true or not true they were for the trek a few years ago. And the truth is I think the, the average uh, elevation gain per day for those first three states is something like 280 feet. And in Virginia, it's like 245 feet. It really isn't that different. However, it does get gentler as the state goes on. The Shenandoahs are pretty sweet and easy. And after that, you are entering the less uh, up and down regions of the mid-Atlantic. Of course, by the time you get there, it's often gonna be high summer and then you're just gonna sweat like you've been dipped in gasoline all day, but it's fun. It's really fun. Virginia is not flat. Another myth, and I, can't, I have no idea why they think this is a myth, but talk to me about Pennsylvania rocks. Um, I think I just put that on there just because everybody has this thing about the state of Pennsylvania and Pennsylvania equals rocks. Well, that's true, but um, Pennsylvania also gives you somewhat of a reprieve. You don't have major big climbs. It's relatively flat. Um, there's some amazing towns um, that you do go through in Pennsylvania. And I think you said it best, Body Blue. I don't know what day it is because it's all jumbling together. But um, I just don't walk pe want people to walk away thinking to dread Pennsylvania. No, no, um, no I'm, so, yeah, absolutely. I, and, if, and if I wasn't clear about that, Embrace it because it is part of what it is. Southern Pennsylvania is gloriously flat. And, and I, I did, even I did a 26 mile day in Southern <laughs> Pennsylvania. I don't normally do a 26 mile drive. So, so a 26 mile day was something for me to do. Um, but then, then you hit Northern Pennsylvania and it is tough, but I would not be without it. It is part of this wonderful thing that's a trail that every single state has its own characteristics most people now jokingly say that Pennsylvania is their worst state, but really every state is a wonderful, wonderful state to be in. Oh yeah, Katahdin does not close on October the 15th. Katahdin, I, I've talked to several of you about this. Katahdin does not close on October 15th. That is a myth. Um, this has to do with accommodations inside Baxter State Park. That's all it's about. And what it is, is Baxter sort of takes a hiatus from camping for everybody on October 15th. Although for through hikers, the Birches uh, shelter site is actually open through October 22nd. But there's a superintendent who can close that mountain on any day of the year for any reason. That would be for weather. It can be for environmental conditions. It could be for trail work, whatever. So that's what happens. But there's not a season where it's like, nope, you can't go up that mountain. So chances are, if the weather's good and everything, you can go. The thing you have to work out then is, well, if I can't sleep in Baxter Park, how am I going to do this? Multiple different ways. I happen to be soboing from... I had flipped, so what I did was I shuttled in from Millinocket, I summited Katahdin, I came down and I hiked 10 miles out to Abel Bridge. I didn't sleep in the park. It wasn't at that time of year anyway, but you could, that's one option. You could shuttle in, do Katahdin, shuttle back out to Millinocket. I mean, there's any number of options. It does not close. Um, I don't think it's a bad thing for hikers to have in mind. Mm, Mid-October is a good time to be done. It'll keep your butt rolling, you know, but um, it does not close. And, and that is just a fact. It's very strange to me how that myth persists, but you don't have to worry about it. On the other hand, you know, I don't know that I would dilly dally. It does, uh, it's Northern, you know, it, you're getting up into central Maine and you can get some serious weather by that time of year. Yeah, yeah definitely. Another one was, um, <laughs> It's kind of an obvious statement, and we talked about rain yesterday, there will always be weather. We didn't actually talk about extreme heat. I've, I remember once walking up a, a mountain in Virginia, and it was apparently at that elevation was about 98 degrees that day, 
it was really hot. I was really working hard. I could suddenly hear this thump, 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 thump behind me. I thought something was coming up behind me. And I turned around and there was nothing there at all. And it was my heart. It was going boom, 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 boom. Because the, I'd, I'd obviously got overheated. I think I was a little bit dehydrated as well. So when you get in the heat of, uh, of the summer, and you will do, you'd appreciate the green tunnel, but then you're out of the green tunnel sometimes. You're going up a mountain and you're walking on a, on a track which is entirely exposed to the sun. Drink as much water as you can. You will never over drink water at that stage. It's a tough thing to do. I mean, you talked about it, there will always be weather. Yeah. There's snow, there's hail. It's America, in, it's America in six months. You're gonna get absolutely every sort of weather you'll ever, ever get. It will be there on the Appalachian Trail. I had a, the reason I put that on there, um, my first solo hike um, that I did by myself, um, and I just thought I was, yeah, you know, and I was, it was in the Smoky Mountains. And that's one of the areas that people are constantly talking about the weather. And uh, in Molly's Ridge Shelter, uh, the first morning um, of my second day, I, I just randomly asked this guy, I said, did you have to uh, catch the weather on your phone? Because I saw him on his phone. And he turned to me and he said, ma'am, there will always be weather. <laughs> said it the nicest way, the kindest way. And you know what? And I said, you're right. And then I started letting myself, you can, once you're outside enough, you get in tune to when those storm clouds are rolling in and when that weather is going to happen. And you could just hear people talking about weather. You never have to look at the weather again until you get to the whites. Uh, you may have to start looking at it when you get to Vermont, but it's going to rain. It's going to do everything like Mighty Blue said. And I think that statement that he said to me really eased my fear about the weather. Yes, I've packed what I needed. Yes, I can get warm. Yes, I'm going to hike in the weather. The weather's not going to stop me and I'm going to have a great time and I'm going to stop obsessing about it because people can get obsessed about the weather. And on the advice, the advice from another hiker, the one of the best bits, I've, I've had advice from a number of different people, which I've remembered this weekend, actually. Um, we've, we've told you about Far Out, which when it first came out was gut hooks, and I was looking at gut hooks all the time. I remember this distinctly. I kept stopping to see what elevation I was at, how far I was up the mountain, because that's kind of encouraging, how far I had to go and so on. And the guy who was with me turned around to me and said, what on earth are you doing? I said, I'm seeing where we are. I said, he said, we're on the trail. There is the rest of the trail. You're going up. And when you get to the top, we'll be at the top. If you keep stopping, you'll inter you'll, you will um, interrupt the rhythm of your hike. And from that moment on, I went up from, I went from one and a half miles per hour, which is not very fast anyway. I went almost instantly to two miles per hour. Because when you stop, you don't just stop dead, look at your thing. You actually start thinking about stopping. You put your poles down, you get your phone out, you check where you are on where you are on the thing, you look around, and then you get your poles back up, you put your phone away. You interrupt your hike so much by keep doing it. And I was doing it, I don't know, every hundred yards, see if I was any closer to the top. He said, that is the trail. And it doesn't matter what you think or what it says on far out or gut hooks as it was then. If it goes up, that's where you're going. If it goes down, that's where you're going and just enjoy it. When you get there, you'll be there. And it was a simple thing, but that actually increased my speed. So it's worth thinking about that. What other myths? Because I've got no other myths in my mind. We got any at all? No, I can't. Well, there, there, there's a saying you'll hear that's a really clever saying, and it's wrong, but it's, <laughs> it's also true. Uh, that when you hit Hanover, so when you hit the New Hampshire border, you've done 80% of the miles. Oh, yeah but only 50%, 20%, 20, 20% sorry, 20% of the effort. But the reality is that's not true. That's an exaggeration uh, in terms of the numbers. Uh, so that's all I'm quibbling with are the numbers. It's just a nice, fun thing to say. It's a little meme, but it is actually true that you are about ready. You've, you've come through so many different things and down here in the south, there's plenty of steep and lots of climbing. 
but it really doesn't compare. New Hampshire and Maine are a completely different story. And completely different. It's a different trail when you get there. Um, and as Miss Janet told me, she likes to say um, uh, that they, they walk, the, the Novos walk into Hanover and they think they're 10 feet tall because they've kicked ass and they've come, you know, 1,800 miles or whatever it is. And they think they can handle and ah, it's going to be nothing. And then they walk into the buzzsaw of everything they've got coming. And, and that's Miss Janet. And she, you know, she has observed lots and lots of people. So I guess the thing is just maintain a little humility. The, the numbers are wrong. But the spirit of that comment is correct. And I will also add this to the Pennsylvania Rocks thing on the Return to Katahdin podcast. I thought it was so great um, that on the Hiking Radio Network because <laughs> Bruce, the hiker, was RTK was reporting, I think th th this is exaggerated. You know, I knew it. And people are just, you know, it, there's rocks, but it's not that bad. And I just sort of looked at my watch and said, well, we'll wait and see. And then the next time he was on the show, he was like, well, <laughs> yeah, I guess I spoke too soon. But it is really what, the last 60 to 80 miles or something, where it's just relentless. And then the truth is, it's pretty rocky after that most of the time. Yeah. So when you get to New Hampshire and Maine, your feet are going to, it's, you know, but, but Pennsylvania is the first time you just hit that persistent day to day rocks. And it is funny because I had the same thought. I was like, well, this isn't bad. And then suddenly you're like, oh, now I know. Now I get it. Is there anything that we, you feel that we haven't covered that you wanted covered or any questions you've got that you, you, you've got concerns over on your hike? Those of you who are actually going? I think for me it was footwear. Oh, oh I you think we should have talked about Yeah, and you know what's recommended or what's good for a certain terrain for other terrain. Whatever. I'm glad you brought that up because I. Cause we've, all, we, we've all got different shoes. Everybody, and I know it's probably it's a personal thing, but. It absolutely is. But you have to get, you definitely have to get a shoe that's fitted properly because a lot of people go and buy a shoe because they see it's the latest shoe on YouTube. Never do that, obviously. I mean, you know that in your life when you get, if you get um, shoes for your kids, you make sure they're fitted and measured and so on. And you have to walk around the shoe. And sometimes I've, I've had a shoe for 100 miles, say, and it just hasn't worked for me. So I get another one. And uh, you just have to get something that's working. These, these ones were given to me. And I, I, I use them in California. And once again, I've had no blisters on the AT. I had no blister on, in California. I wore sandals when I did the Camino in, in Spain. I had more blister than foot. I, I just got blisters with sandals all the time. So you just never know how it's gonna work for you. So before you go on any hike, you need to make sure you've worn your shoes in and that you feel they work for you and you can just get out there and uh, be comfortable. But you want to talk about Yeah, my, uh, my recommendation is that you go to a proper outfitter and let them measure your foot, analyze your foot. Um, and I learned after all these years of hiking, this summer I actually had, and I've been to uh, fittings before, a proper fitting down in Georgia at Outdoor 76. Those guys down there are amazing. They are feet engineers. Um, and I literally learned, I'm a, my shoe size, I'm a European 42 and a half. And they have this whole theory of how we should all be going by European sizes. And the Americans are the only ones that don't use um, the Shocker. European Shocker. measurement. <laughs> and he brought out, and I was like, really? You know, he's like, I'm going to prove it to you. Uh, so he brought out Ultra, Hoka, New Balance, Boot Keens, you know, 10 different pairs of shoes in what size I thought I was, and they were all different. And then he brought out my European 42 and a half. In one of them, I was a women's 11. In the other one, I was, um, you know, a men's nine. In the other one, I was this or this, but they were all my European size. And for a female, the average width of a shoe is considered a B. Well, they measure, I'm a C plus. So that's why I always went with men's shoes because they're a D. I was right there to go with the width of a men's shoe, but 
but I was always wearing the wrong length because you're always told, put your thumb at the end of the shoe, you know, test your big toe. Well, my middle toes are longer than my big toe. So that makes no sense for me. Um, so for the first time ever since I started hiking, you know, in the early 2000s, I am actually in my proper size 42 and a half European shoe. And it's funny because when you go to other shoe stores, uh, I went to a Fleet Feet the other day with a friend of mine, and I said, yeah, I want to try those. I was just looking for uh, some dressier uh, running shoes I could wear to work. And uh, I said, I'm a European 42 and a half. And the guy was like, oh, no, you're a da-da-da. I said, I would like to try on the 42 and a half. And it just, I mean, you would have thought I had asked him to, like, cut all of his fingers off on his hands. And he finally brought me a couple pairs that were 42 and a half and they fit. So my recommendation is um, get properly fitted wherever that is in your area and ask them for your European size because you'll notice on boxes, there's two or three different sizes. And I know Justin, you went down to Outdoor 76 and got fitted. I mean, it's, a, it's an amazing experience. They will spend hours with you um, Are there any, is it any other states or is it just in one place? Just in one, they're just in, in Georgia, Franklin. two shops in Franklin. Um, and the other thing is, if you don't take care of your feet, to me it's the number one, and yeah. I say this and you're like, well, Jester, you didn't figure out your feet until like this summer, but it'll run your hike. It will run your, your feet will stop you from hiking, not your pack, not your this, not your that. Um, if your shoes don't fit properly and you're riddled with blisters and your socks don't work and um, one thing it like Mighty Blue wears a liner and a sock. My feet get so hot there's no way I could wear a liner and another sock. Can't do it. And I get in the summertime since I do the majority of my hiking in the summer for some reason if I wear a sock uh, higher than a no-show I get heat rash. Don't know why. It's just how my body operates. So I can't, I see hikers in these long socks. I can't do it. Um, just something about my skin, my pores and things like that. So just, and if you look around, everybody's got all, everybody's got all different shoes and that's okay. Cause it's the shoe that fits. So it's really, cause that's my thing. Like I have hundreds of dollars in boots and you still haven't found one. So, but I guess that's everybody. You just that's have everybody. to do the trial and error. It's trial and error, and you can. I mean, you can listen to. You can go on on just say Facebook and any one of the groups and ask, hey, what kind of shoes you know are the best, and you will get ten thousand different answers. And some people have to wear boots because, you know, maybe they've sprained their ankle so many times, or they've had a previous injury, or. You know, maybe they have to wear orthotic or a shoe insole or something like that. And the best way is to get a proper fitting. And for me, it's that European sizing. And the other day I wore ultras up at Dismal Falls and I'm going to actually throw my ultras in the garbage. Um, they suck for me, for me and other people wear them and they're wonderful. Um, because I could feel every single thing and I was like, okay. I, I don't operate like this. I like a more firm, sturdy shoe. And my go-to is the uh, Brooks Cascadia. I've done thousands, thousands of miles in the Brooks Cascadia. Well, the Brooks Where Cascadia is more like a, a, ten, a, a, a trail runner. Trail runner. And I, I was and that has side. a stiff enough bottom to it? Yeah. Okay. So, so I have a few thoughts. Yeah. Um, so there's my theory. Yeah, I, I get asked about this sometimes. And I, I wear trail runners. But people, I get asked fairly frequently, well, you know, why, why do people wear the trail runners versus boots? So how much support do you need for your ankles? You need to think about that. Now you can get trail runners that actually come up over your ankle. Topo makes one. Um, so that's, that's one factor for people who want to wear boots. Um, they last longer. So they might be a little expensive, more expensive, but like, you know, you're going to wear, you're going to go through more pairs of trail runners. So those are advantages. Nice. They're or the support, like on the rocks and roots. Right. So, so they've got a, you know, a stiffer, thick sole and so forth. The flip side that I say, and other people say on boots is one of the things is they just take longer to dry out. 
almost always just because they're thicker material and the way they're built and so forth so they don't breathe as well you're probably going to sweat some more they might be wet longer you know whatever but that is just a you know that's a personal choice the factors that you need to think about are you know like this company that i really like when you go and you look at any model it's going to tell you how much cushioning it's got it's going to tell you whether it's stability or neutral stability meaning stiffer you know neutral so what is your foot like um you were wearing loan peaks is that right yeah so the loan peaks i've i've worn them as a stopgap when i couldn't get the shoe i wanted the lone peak ultra very popular you'd see probably a lot of these kids have had them on they just have almost no cushioning remember you're taking typically you're going to take between 2000 and 2500 steps per mile and how many miles are you going to do a day and they say it's going to be about five million steps and every time you pick up your foot it might be only five ounces different six ounces different add those ounces up so that's the other thing um and then i think the only other point i want to make at first it's so individual you just have to keep trying have you ever tried hiking in a trail type shoe yeah. you have so the only other thing i would say is that i was older even and my feet changed you know with the miles they did i started i did the Colorado trail in hokas i loved them because they had that padding that i really liked and i had been running in them and i started on the at and i did 860 miles and my feet were screaming i got something called sesamoiditis these two little tiny little bones at the ball of your foot they're they're free floating um because my feet changed and they spread out just from all the impact I couldn't and have never been able to wear Hoka's again. That's when I switched to Ultras. I switched out of Ultras because they're higher cushioning models. The company's been sold a couple times. Now they just redesigned them so they're narrower. So I went to this company, Topo, Topo Athletic. Yeah, and I, I, I really like them. They're wide in the front. They've got a relatively wider heel compared to all the Ultras except the Lone Peak. This model that I'm test driving this to do a review, although I saw some kids, two, two of these kids had them. This is like their version of the Ultra Olympus, which is their sort of high cushion trail shoe. I do like it a lot. I mean, as we get older, we lose um, fat pad on the bottom of our feet. That's just a fact. So um, maybe kids can get away with lone peaks where we kind of can't. Um, yeah, I don't know. I, you know, again, they are. I, 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 for sure, most people who wind up doing this the longer distances go with a lighter shoe. It just dries out easier and it's, and it's less to lift on every one of those. I had heavy oboes. I loved every single second in yeah. those shoes. So, you know, that, that's the difference. It can be light, it can be heavy. It's whatever it works for you. But you've got, I've seen people go on the Springer and I remember seeing them up there. They had literally brand new boots on. I mean, that's a catastrophe waiting to happen. Now you've just got to get used to them. You'll know whether it works for you or not. And, and there's it, nothing wrong with boots. And it's not the same walking on a flat as it is walking uphill or even walking on rocks. So all those things, you have to try to do those things as much as you can beforehand. And the little thing in the store that they have you step up on, this, yeah. I don't even step up on, they say that and I'm like, okay, I, I know. I mean, you just get to a point where. And you know, this will probably sound crazy to people. It sounded crazy to me, but when I was on the AT, I met several people who were hiking in sandals. So I got interested in that and I ended up writing a story about it, interviewing some of those people and others and experts. I have hiked in very minimalist sandals uh, from zero. Somebody had zeros, are those your zeros? I've got zero. Your camp, camp shoes. Yeah. And you know what? It's not crazy. It's not as crazy as it seems. I've done, oh, certainly, five or 600 miles in sandals, I personally wouldn't, I, my feet aren't gonna wanna do that all the time. But I'll tell you, especially in really hot, cause it, I, it'll it blow you away. The first 90 miles on the CDT, you come through the Chihuahuan desert from the Mexican border. And I don't know what it is, but everybody, no matter how experienced or how much they love their shoes, it just really hammers your feet, probably cause of the heat and, it's pretty flat and, and you know, to have the sandals as an option saved my feet when I was hiking through what I call the great Nebraska Savannah and it was 98 degrees. Mm. I can take off my shoes, the hot spots are developing and I just throw on those minimalist zero sandals, 
hike with them for 10 miles. So it's not about, you know, it's not as crazy. I would never do it the whole way. Because that's some of the time I have chacos and love those things. And I'll hike because we go to a, we call it the blue hole and swim. So I want to take those like in with my their water, these right? And some of those, I'll come back with no pain because it's the, you know, it's the stability, I think, too, because they have that thick sort of tire sole to them. Hmm. But it isn't like you'd want to hike in them all the time. Yeah. But that, sometimes those are my best hikes with those chocolates. Yeah, the whole barefoot running craze with, with ultra runners and stuff that happened around 2000, I don't know, 10, as the book came out, it, it sort of came and went. I don't know if you saw the Vibram five finger, the, the toe shoes, they sort of... Yeah, they they came and went for a variety of reasons, but there there's some really interesting write, books and actual science out there talking about what what humans evolved to do and what we're good at, which is long, slow distance, which is what we do here. We can chase down any animal on earth, but a, a lot of that is looking at the feet too and why. So traditional running shoe, hiking shoe, trail design, whatever has your heel elevated that's not normal if you're in bare feet now not everybody can do as what they call a zero drop but again there's a philosophy behind it and why you do it this company zero shoes started by some people that i know and they're very adamant of course because they're selling shoes but there's all, there's no cushion on their shoes basically and they're all zero drop and you'd think oh well that's nuts but i have I, i've been surprised that I can hike, like I say, I wouldn't do a whole hike in it, but many, many options. And there are some people who have barefoot hiked the Appalachian Trail. The which is foot. which is crazy. Yeah, and they didn't really, really, they did wear shoes during some snow and stuff, but you can read their books, the, the Barefoot Sisters, Nobo and Sobo, they did a book for each journey. It's interesting. There's a guy that hiked my year and also done it again this year, wearing Crocs the whole way. We've done it a couple times. <laughs> so I don't know if we answered your question, but you know, yeah, I mean, I just keep listening to what everybody says and just go try. I just recommend going and getting a fitting. Yeah. Let me let me say this about about shoes also. Um, I mean, it don't have anything to do with, with fitting or or whatnot, but I know for through hiking the the AT, there are certain brands that if your shoe wears out while you're hiking. You call them up, they'll send you another pair. Obos. Obos is one. I know Merrill's is one. I know there's several others. Yes, there. These are Merrill's, but see the bottom of these isn't enough. Do you have narrow feet? Wide feet? Wide feet? No, I need a wider toe box. I have okay. um, Neromas. Yes. And um, that's my issue. And the, it'll make like my. Sometimes I can tell. Like as soon as the shoe goes, and if I sit there for a little bit, walk around the store, and all of a sudden my feel start to burn, I'm like, ah, burning. Off. This is not going to work. So sometimes I'll know right away that they're not they fit perfectly, but there's just something about the way they're on my. Have I don't you tried know. the wider toe box shoes? Yeah, but I, I don't like the Keens at all. Have you tried Ultras? No. Have you tried Topo? No, I think that's that so, might be my next. I, I tell you, that solved my sesamoiditis program, uh, problem on the AT right away. I was in ultras, unfortunately, I was in the Olympus, which was their, their heavier cushion shoe. They did not last. So durability is another thing. When you wear boots, you don't have to replace them. If you wear trail runners on the AT, most people are gonna go through at least five pairs, if not more. So that's a factor too. Oh, yeah. It just is the way it is. I blew out a pair of ultras after 250 miles in the rocks of Pennsylvania, so. so what about other questions? Any thought? Any last thoughts in terms of things you, you we haven't covered? Are you quite relaxed now? You were relaxed before anyway, weren't you? Yeah. <laughs> you knew she was okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I have no qualms about Betty going on the trip. You know, apropos of myths. You know what? That's, that's interesting. Because I, you, know, you guys are going to be out there, and I'm sure that there's going to be 500 to 1,000 like minded people i wasn't that it wasn't that a treat to meet these some of these youngsters yesterday i mean they're they're just having having the time of their lives they're they're, they're kind yeah they're, exactly we both we all were weren't we yeah and it was just great to see them see a that. apropos of myths this was one of the myths i wrote about is it 
it's only women get asked this question. Are you going by yourself? That's crazy. It's not crazy. It's really not crazy as on any of these big trails, but especially, especially on the Appalachian Trail. Uh, you're not going to be alone. You might be alone once you get up north, depending on the time of year. You might be hiking, but it's very, very safe. The community is safe. It looks out for each other. Every once in a while, there's an oddball or some quirky thing. But percentage-wise, statistically, it's just incredibly safe for women and everybody. Mm -hmm. so. You know, what's interesting about all the people that came in last night is the age. They were all young. There were no, no 40, 50, 60. I, I think it's because, it's because they are, it's, it's the, the per, so going Sobo is right. a time of college graduation. Yeah. And I think that's the main, the main reason most of them. Too. Hawk is a little older. And there were a couple guys I had breakfast with. They were a little middle-aged, um, but I think Sobo is a little bit more of a of a. It's a little bit of a quirkier thing to do. It's considered in so so young people. You said it many times. Oh, start gosh. This demographic of this group in general, though, is way low from what it is on average in my experience. But you get a lot of people who are older who have done life, and a lot of people who are younger who have sort of done the first couple horizons in life and not as many in those working years of, you know, late, late 20s, 30s, They're 40s. They're getting to be more and more. And I've yeah. noticed recently people I'm interviewing that people are just giving up on their lives, aren't they? And they're saying, oh, I'm going to do something different. Maybe, maybe the whole COVID thing yeah. inspired some people too. Shook a lot of people up. So, anything else you need? All I would say, by the way, all I would say to you all, if you've got any other questions you think of when you're going away, you say, wish I'd asked that, please reach out to us and, uh, yeah. and, and we'll try our best to answer it. And any help we can give you when you, while you're planning this, just let us know and just stay in touch. And we'd love to help you out, get, you know, achieve your dream because this is a, it's a worthwhile dream, I tell you. You'll, nev bad. you'll never get over it. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for coming. It's been a joy to, to meet you all. And I think good we, luck, yeah, everybody. good luck. Good luck to all of you. <laughs>